Well, I was going to... No, go ahead. He, he, no, no, he was just going to say... He was just going to say Black Life Didn't Have Today, our guest is... This is the good stuff in the program. Hey, so. hey, this is what we do all the time. <laughs> welcome, <laughs> go ahead. welcome to Black Light on Sports. My name is Charles Harmon. I'm uh, Dr. Mitchell Palmer McDonald. And our guest today um, has been a fixture um, in the Twin Cities um, community. Um, probably since the mid nineties, am I correct? Late nineties. Yeah. Late nineties. All right. Um, we're going to, um, he's a basketball coach. He also, um, is a community, um, activist and, um, we want to introduce you to, uh, Colin Moore. Colin, it's nice for you to come and spend time with us. I appreciate the invite. It's wonderful to okay. be around you too. Right. I always feel blessed when I get a chance to run into you guys. <laughs> The weird location. So Perkins late at night after the game on Thursday or Friday. Yeah, people know oh, I'm sorry. I won't say which Perkins. Hey, no. yeah, true. I say which Perkins. Okay, um, you know, you know, talk about, you know, talk about your journey. Um, you know, probably, you know, probably when, you know, your childhood, your upbringing, and what brought you to Minnesota. All right, my childhood. Uh, born and raised in Waukegan, Illinois, on the Great Lakes Naval Base. My okay. father was an Army guy. Somehow got. Uh, finagled his way into a uh, station at Great Lakes. My mother was a Navy girl. Um, they got together and had a kid. And <laughs> like uh, most relationships, when people are in their 19s and 20s, it did not last. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Realized once the service was over and the, the regimen of that life was over that they just weren't compatible. Mm -hmm. So my mother, who's a New York native, Harlem girl, born and raised in Harlem, um, took her baby and ran back to Harlem. Okay. So I uh, moved to Harlem and for my first eight to 10 years of my life, I was in Harlem going back and forth between there and Chicago in the summers. Um, then my father did the manly thing and asked for his son. And mm -hmm. I began my life in Chicago and spent and reversed it. And now I spent summers in New York and spent my uh, school years in Chicago from like 11 on mm -hmm. through high school. So, um, live that life back and forth going back and forth between grandparents because both parents were really too busy trying to get themselves together and figure out their lives so um live raised by both of my grandparents in harlem and then we moved to queens after that to corona queens yeah. mm -hmm. um but uh then the rest of my time in chicago was on the south side 79th street uh wonderful community grand crossing and, and avalon area so uh Lived there, went to school there, did everything in those two communities and really have friends who can tell you like, hey, I grew up with him. Then they'll be like, how do you, how'd you grow up with him? I grew up with him. I grew up with both of you. I was in both cities. So okay. yeah, that's, that's, that, that's a little bit of my little young upbringing. Um, finished high school in Chicago, went away to college, um, went to uh, HBCU, and I'm going to let it be unnamed because I did not spend a lot of time there. I was asked to go home. Um, okay. I had a lot of issues when I was younger. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. um, so I, uh, which kind of leads into a lot of the other stuff that I do currently. Um, had a lot of issues, was asked to leave, went home, took a half of a semester off, went to a small, a small Lutheran school in Kenosha, Wisconsin, mm -hmm. Carthage College. Okay. Um, did, did the rest of my time there besides another summer year down at Southern University. I will mention that one though. Uh, Southern University. Oh, so it was another HBCU. I finished at the, yeah. I okay, so you went to university. two HBCUs. I did. Okay. The first one I was talking about. What, um, before you move on, what high school did you graduate from? I went to Whitney Young Magnet High School. Whitney Young, okay. And really, you, you have to, I have to say the entire name. People in Chicago don't say they went to Young. They say Whitney Young Magnet High School. <laughs> if, I, if I say the entire name, I would not be uh, accepted. Okay. Yeah. All right. But I went there, graduated from there in 1991. Mm -hmm. Um. We've had a good time, great school. Michelle Obama's an alumnus. Mm -hmm. The people who uh, took credit for writing the uh, Matrix series, they mm -hmm. went to Whitney Young. It's really a uh, fine academic institution. So, okay. Then I went to uh, Carthage, <laughs> uh, met some of my most beloved, lifelong friends and guys who became my fraternity brothers okay. uh, eventually, um, who helped kind of. It's weird because some I, some people don't think that your friend group or your peer group can help steer your 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 life or can help you change your viewpoint on life i met these young these men same age as me and they gave me a 
a purpose that was showed me like, hey, I can be different. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's acceptable to be intelligent, well spoken, studious. Okay, I, I can I can rock with those guys. So um those became my lifelong friends and kind of uh from from college after finishing college, did not know exactly what I wanted to do. Uh got an internship at ASCAP in the music industry. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my parents is has a little is a person of acclaim in the music industry. Okay. Um, was, God bless her, she's passed now, but she was the uh, vice president of a major record company mm -hmm. in the uh, publicity department. So um, she got me an internship with ASCAP. I worked with ASCAP. I worked that for a year or so. Uh, left that one, went to do an internship with RCA Records um, with her, basically. Uh, realized that's not my calling. Though mm -hmm. it looks glamorous and fun, it's just not my calling. Um, so tried to figure out what I want to do. Moved to Columbus, Ohio. Yeah, I was, I was moving around trying to find my stuff. Um, didn't know what I wanted to do there either. But I had a cousin who was living there. He was like, "Yeah, hey, just come and waste time with me then." So <laughs> I uh, moved there. Decided I did a quick, fast, easy way to uh, make some money and pay off some of these college loans that I had accrued mm -hmm. from so many different places. Was to uh, sell cars. So I became a car salesman. Oh wow! And use my powers of manipulation <laughs> to uh, make a couple of dollars and pay some bills. Um, <laughs> did that for a while. That had a came to an end. Moved back to Chicago. Um, did not know what I was going to do. Was kind of rudderless there. Was living with my grandmother, who always kept an open door for me. Uh, Christmas Eve, lost one of my best friends. Decided Chicago is not the place for me anymore. <clears throat> um, and then on the 7th of January in 1997, mm -hmm. I caught a bu a train here, not knowing anybody, <laughs> and uh, decided I'm moving to Minnesota and I'm staying <laughs> and kind of uh, do some help of uh, church and, and the city pages, mm -hmm. found a place to stay and stayed in the old, in the older lady's uh, dormer attic and Work, started working at St. Joe's Home for Children and two weeks later and just uh decided I'm never going I'm never leaving. So yeah, and I've been here ever since. Man, that's quite <clears throat> that's quite the journey. How did you get um involved with coaching? It's strange because uh when I got up here I had no friends, no family, nothing. So all I did was go travel around and play basketball. Oh because that's kind of my my thing. I enjoy playing. It's my it's my peaceful time. It's it, it kept me in shape at the time. It, it gave me an outlet um, for for my extra energy. And so I just played a lot of basketball. Um, would go across the rivers. I actually grew up in the community that we're filming in right now. I not grew up, but mm -hmm. lived in this community and played all the time at King Park and Richard Green down the street. Um, <clears throat> met my uh my wife, and she is a St. Paul girl. Mm -hmm. And so uh, through meeting her and getting married and having our first child, I ended up living in St. Paul. Well, I didn't have the same outlets in St. Paul that I did in Minneapolis. Okay. So I uh, didn't have the opportunity to play as much as I wanted to. And my wife saw that I was like losing my mind without having an outlet. And I was sitting in the house studying basketball and watching every game. And she's like, you need to do something. <laughs> so she, uh, it's working. She's a lifelong park and rec, St. Paul park and rec person. Mm -hmm. Been doing it for years. She's actually phenomenal at it. Um, she basically coerced me into coaching a little team at a Northwest Como Rec Center, <laughs> which is in a, it's, it's in a community that's nothing like uh, any community I've ever lived in until that point. So mm -hmm. the kids I was I had, I'm like, ooh. I don't know what I'm gonna do with this. <laughs> you kid, you guys are natural ball players, so. Uh, agreed to do it, gave me an outlet, did my best to turn these guys into a, a decent team, and mm -hmm. um, it kind of gave me an itch. Now I'm like, oh, I, th I think I can replace playing with coaching, mm -hmm. you know. So I uh, coached for a while, and a uh, guy named Christopher Oley, who was the head coach at mm -hmm. St. Paul Arlington at the time, mm -hmm. it's no longer exists. It's now St. Paul Washington. Mm -hmm. He, uh, my wife worked there as well. I was working for Catholic. Chip excuse me, for Catholic Charities, he uh, saw that I had a little team and they were making a little noise mm -hmm. and upsetting some bigger, more uh, prominent rec centers around St. Paul. And 
Ask me, hey, would you like to come and coach our freshmen? I got nothing else to do. I don't know anything in St. Paul. I got nothing else. I got a bunch of time. So I took that opportunity, and it's been downhill ever since. Or some would say uphill. You say uphill, but <laughs> yeah, for me, it's come coming to my to an end of my coaching career. So you, you say you're coming to your end right now. Ends. It's almost over. It's it's been since 1999. Mm -hmm. I've been coaching. I think that's long enough. You know, I'm starting to get kids of the kids I coached mm -hmm. when I first started. So. Okay, okay. Yeah, you're, you're, yeah. you're, you're sounding like me as far as my, uh, <laughs> my, te my, my teaching and writing. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm writing about I'm writing about the people, and they say, you wrote about my dad, you wrote about my mom, and yeah. then I have people that come and tell me, you know, you taught you taught my you you taught my mom, you know, you taught. I'm like, yeah, yeah. maybe, maybe yeah. and you know, you think like yeah. that sometimes ago. Okay. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. Um, maybe it is. So it's time for me now, to end it. Now, when you you were at Arlington, yes. and then you um, when you left there, did you did you go to Johnson or did you? Yes, I was at uh, Arlington. Coached well, at the time it was a freshman team. Okay. Coached freshman team uh, for two years. Moved up for three years to coach as the assistant varsity coach. Mm -hmm. Uh, under Tim Lang, Tim Lang okay. stepped down. Mm -hmm. Applied for the varsity job. Mm -hmm. I was hoping to, to get that position. Uh, was not, I wasn't prepared at that time mm -hmm. to get that position. I was still <clears throat> a lot, a little raw around the edges. I still had a lot of my uh, other mentality that would show itself at times. <laughs> so, uh, I, you know, it, was, it turned into a blessing. So I uh, didn't get that job. But uh, the legendary Vern Simmons who's like a big brother mentor to me, mm -hmm. reached out to my wife, threw my wife to me to ask me to come and come and be his assistant because DeMar Suggs, a Johnson legendary player, St. Paul legendary player, mm -hmm. he uh, was moving on to coach junior college. And uh, Willie Taylor, Willie Tyler, I'm sorry, Willie mm -hmm. Tyler was going to take the girls program at Johnson. Mm -hmm. So he wanted an assistant next to him. And I'd always had really, really successful times against Johnson even though they were the powerhouse. So he brought me in and um, I stayed by his side until he retired. Okay. Um, what were some things, who were some people that uh, encouraged you along the way? I know you mentioned Vern, you mentioned yeah. some other people. Were there other people earlier in your life that, that you look back on and say, you know, they, they kind of pointed me into the direction that I'm in right now? Yeah, to be honest, my uh, my fraternity brothers, that the guys that I pledged with, Rod Frazier, Rick Johnson, mm -hmm. lifelong friends, more brothers than friends, who mm -hmm. knew me when I was extremely rough around the edges, um, to this more smoothed out, well rounded man that you see before you now. <laughs> um, they uh, they always encourage me to you know give it a shot, go for it, try something, do something different. Don't be afraid to step out mm -hmm. and try to do something that you're passionate about. So they were really inspir in, uh, inspirational. My wife, Mary Moore, was really inspirational. She was, I mean, she she bought into me when I had nothing going on for myself and really poured into me and helped me become who I am and saw my passion for the game and understood how much it meant to me to give back to kids because that's all I've ever done since I left the uh, – the music industry is in that short stint with the car selling cars is worked in uh as a youth worker so youth worker slash social work that's what my degree is in so, uh, she saw that i could combine the two via basketball and kind of encouraged me to go for it then i was so blessed to be around Vern, who just he's just Vern. <laughs> now, now that is true yes great guy um, Man, a few words, but when he says something, it has, it's impactful. He would tell me little stories, drop little nuggets here and there to keep me motivated, have me thinking. And then he would start, and then he began to trust me. Okay. And so the more and more he trusted me, the more it, really, it built trust in myself, that my ideas, my thoughts, my everything was, I was headed in the right direction. So those were kind of the inspirations for me, especially when it comes to basketball. Okay. Yeah, we had a. I love coaching against Vern, and one thing about it because he respected us, 
we weren't always the best program, but he wanted us to, he always wanted to play us every year because he felt that we got the best out of each other. Um, and he was always highly complimentary of us in terms of how we did things. Mm -hmm. I always enjoyed coaching, I, you know, miss him because, you know, he was always, you know, you don't get too many coaches, friends. True. Uh, you, you're more competitive, and then we get into all the ego kind of stuff. <laughs> but Vernon was never like that. No, so not at all. We come over there, you know, we talk and we chit chat. Yeah. We chit chat and do freshman game and JV game, and, you know, he's over with his team. No. We, we talk about all kind of stuff because that's, you know, no. how you do it when you're working with kids. What, what the uniqueness that brings out of you when you work with young people? When I work with young people, I try to be my authentic self. I try to be as open and honest about who I, who I was, what I was into, how I think, and try to be as genuine to them and show them all of my faults as well as who I am today so that they can uh, understand this. You, you guys are unwritten books. We haven't seen your final chapters yet. You can continue to pour into him. That's something I took from Byron because as he would ask me questions about who I was and who I used to be and things I used to do, he just continued to pour into me. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it became my uh, part of my passion in terms of coaching young people is to pour into them. And I found that to be unique in a lot of ways because it wasn't necessarily what I learned in a book. Mm -hmm. Those techniques didn't necessarily work for me. What I what they were teaching me in college uh, that was that became just a receipt. I, mm -hmm. The things that I that I became became necessary for me as I became successful, I didn't learn that in school. I learned that outside. I learned that in talking to people. I learned that through relationships. How to build relationships. How to build rapports. How to be around other other individuals who and how to share ideas. I, um, welcome differences. So mm -hmm. I learned all those things. You know those unique things during that time. Burns is instrumental in those. Because like, we actually would love, we used to love coming over to play you guys. Yeah. It was one of the one of the strangest things. It's the year we had our most successful season. One of our toughest games was with you guys. <laughs> and we were like, hey, we're about to lose. I think we're going to lose this game, man. And you're, and you're, and you're at uh, Minneapolis South, right? Yeah. I just want our viewers to know. Yeah. 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 It's Minneapolis That's South. The kid, the kid that lit y'all up that night that was his first. That was his first start in varsity. Yeah, we had injuries. Okay, and so he was a JV player. We said, "Well, bring him up and we throw him out there." You know, so we, you know, we playing Johnson. You know, John undefeated. We, you know, yeah. he went crazy. He went crazy. <laughs> he went crazy. And we came. We we was a, we was in a minute. It was a minute to go, and we was really within three. Yes, and nobody at that time. I mean, we never got that. Close. Everybody. It was twenty something point, thirty point games, and yep. We got to South, and our guys were kind of like, oh, we got this. I, I don't that. think so. Yeah. And, you know, every time we come over to play South, we knew it was going to be a tough game. It was going to be a respectful environment. It was going to be competitive, but it was. It was yeah, they, to they, told, they told me, the players told me not to come because it was going to be because it was going to be a blowout. But then, then when they came into class, they were quiet. You know, I was like, how'd they go? But they were quiet. They were like, yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> so you were able to keep those guys quiet? Mm -hmm. No, they no, 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 but kept quiet. them. No, what kept them quiet was they almost they almost <laughs> lost. That's what kept them quiet because they were they were like they were like Mr. McDonald, man, you don't need to come, man. You know, it's gonna yeah. be another twenty. And I'm like, I'm like, I don't know, you know. But what, what do we know? You know, to young yeah. people, what do we know? Right. <laughs> and then uh, no, it's, so when they came back to class the next day, I just said, you know, how was it? And I mean, it was it was just quiet. Like they were just like they were they were just like they were they were like we won, but there there were no details. Uh -oh. There was no, you know, anything like that. You know, we we won. Then one, and then after class, one player walked up to me and said, "Man, man, Mr. McDonald, yeah, he said we almost lost. Mm -hmm. That's what he said." So, yeah. so that was the yeah. um, that was the thing. Um, when you're coaching, when you're coaching, you know, we know about the basketball part. You wanna, you wanna, you know, you wanna, um, you know, you wanna win games. You want that. Um, what other lessons? Uh, are you trying to get your players or what are other things that you're trying to get your players to understand that will help them in the future? Well, one of my, um, one of my mottos for coaching is, is or my philosophies for coaching is that I don't coach basketball. I coach life. Basketball is just the tool I use to 
get in front of you. Mm-hmm. Um, and another is that Johnson's not really a basketball program. It's just a family who happens to all play basketball. Mm-hmm. So I, I, one of the things that I use basketball to teach is, is, as I said, life. But trying to help those young men understand that you're not alone in life. There's a community. There's a support system that you're going to have to lean upon sometimes in their needs. And, and just trying to help cultivate that family atmosphere mm-hmm. for the young people that I coach. Um because there, there were times where I didn't feel like I had anybody to, to lean upon. When I told you I moved here. I moved here by myself. I don't have any aunts, uncles, cousins, nobody. I got off the – and I was, <laughs> hey, I'm here. You know, I'll figure this out. I would have loved to have had some 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 structure here, something to lean upon, some guidance at that time. So I use basketball and, and, and what I've done in basketball and what my main focus is is try to create that structure for these young men. We're going to play games. We're going to win. We're going to lose. But mm-hmm. that doesn't define you. It's about what you do post-basketball. Mm-hmm. It's about the, you helping the next man. It's about you being transcendent in how you live your life. Are you going to come back and grab the next man and pull him up? Um, if you take those lessons and then you apply them on the basketball court about having your your brother's back, being there and being accountable to him at every month for every thing that you do both on the court and in the classroom that's equally as important as what we do on the court and on the court so mm-hmm. uh, those are kind of my philosophies about basketball those are what I'm teaching just being responsible being responsible for yourself being responsible to your 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 fellow person your your teammate your brother that you're playing with um, giving your best effort in the classroom and on the court at all times being your authentic self uh, one thing I always loved about coaching is our Johnson is our teams are so diverse, and I don't, and I'm not mean ethnic, ethnically diverse. I mean just in per, terms of personality. Mm-hmm. We got transient kids from Chicago, Gary, Indiana, Kansas City, um, uh, people from the, the the five royal families of St. Paul mm-hmm. who send their kids to play for us, and it's just to watch them mold and meld into one family unit that still sustains itself almost you know twenty years later. And they hold each other to a standard almost 20 years later where they're raising their kids around each other. Um, that's what I'm teaching when it comes to basketball is how to be a part of a community that's much larger than yourself. So. Yeah, we, we've gone through COVID. It's not gone away where we're going. <laughs> how much have you seen the effect of that to your players and to the people and the young people that you work with? Oh, what do we... I mean, you both work. We work work with young people. What do we? This the first group of the senior group is the first ones who went through all four years of high school. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, so you can see the effects of missing those two years of of school, those two years of socialization, those two years of uh, of interacting with peers and adults in a structured um, situation. We've got young people that they literally cannot sit in a class that long because they haven't had to do it it was during COVID. it was check in on the computer and mm-hmm. knock out your work virtually and, and, and you know so your teacher might hop on for 20 30 minutes but that's that's if you're lucky you know what i'm saying so they um they're trying to to still trying to adjust back to some normality mm-hmm. and then the, the what's become normal for them now is not uh what's what was normal before COVID. Mm-hmm. The, the 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 sense of hard work, the sense of determination, the um the accountability it's 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 gone, and we have to try to rebuild it, and it's it's all in my opinion remnants of that that pandemic that ripped through us and changed our norms. Mm-hmm. So, it changed it big time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I want to go back to, and not to be nosy, no, no. curious than anything. Why did you choose Minnesota? Oh, I got a degree in social work, and then I'm I'm a I'm an avid reader. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm kind of a sneaky nerd. Um, <laughs> I read that Minnesota has a lot of jobs in the uh, social service sector, mm-hmm. and then they paid well, mm-hmm. and it was a grossly liberal city. <laughs> and so leaving New York for a little short for a stint, and going to uh, Columbus, Ohio, then going back to Chicago, I'm like what's where can I make this degree mean something? So 
Well, this education means something. These skills mean something. I was like, Minnesota, I guess. And then everybody else in Chicago moves here too. So why not? <laughs> I just jumped, I just jumped in and find, find my way amongst the rest of us Chicago people up here. So did you ever regret not going, not staying in music? Absolutely not. I saw what it did to my mother. Okay. Uh, my mother, my mother was the vice president of RCA, mm. the Black Music Division, for about ten years, mm. no, fifteen years, and the the uh, nine eleven. It did Tim Towers that changed the music industry totally, and she was let go from an industry that she had been a staple in for twenty five years, and um, it, it kind of destroyed her the, the change. Um, her work in publicity and, and, and promotion it just wasn't the same, and my mother has a, had a different uh, outlook on life than I did, and I wasn't comfortable with some of the things that I was going to be asked to do or some of the manipulation things that I was. Uh, gonna be forced to say so to make this all work for everybody specifically us on this end though not necessarily you talented individuals and i really like music because i feel like these people are like geniuses a lot of our musicians and i came up onto that era the curtis mayfields the stevie wonders mm -hmm. the, the guys who made seminal albums who, who actually talked about issues and i don't What's it into the bubble gum and let's make a couple dollars? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Let's let's convince everybody that this group is phenomenal. I'm like, but I hate this song. This song is terrible. I don't want to pub publish publicize this song because it's trash. So I was like, I gotta find something else to do. Thanks, thanks for no thanks, Mark. So. Now when you uh, I did notice this uh the last couple of years when you started coaching. Is that um, I a, head a lot of times when you started head coach okay. when you were when you when you became the head coach, I did notice that um, after games, there's a lot of uh, former players in the locker room um, listening to your talk and then afterwards um, interacting with the team. Um, how important how important um, was that for you? to see that happen uh, and, you know, how important was that, um, you know, for your team, for your players? Oh, okay. Well, I, I, to me, honest with, to be honest with you, that's probably the most important piece to me is that they're alumni and I was there in 08 mm -hmm. that know the kids who played in 15 mm -hmm. and the 15s are still there and know the 19s and the 19s are still interested in coming watching the current guys, they all want to sit together and there is a Johnson way of doing things. And that, that was, uh, that means a lot to me personally, mm -hmm. cause I, I feel like, uh, I don't, I don't coach basketball. I told you I coach life and having these young men and always having my phone open my house open and being accessible to these young men. Um, I wanted them to not pay ever try to pay me back for anything I've ever done for them. I needed them to pay forward. Mm -hmm. Take care. Help me take care of these. This next group of young men. Mm -hmm. They're they're the ones who need to hear your stories. They're the ones who need your testimony to give them some strength, to give them some, to help them persevere through whatever they're having to deal with. I need you to help me help them. Um, you guys know what the expectations are. What I ask of you, how demanding Vern was, how demanding I was, uh, Coach Tone. We're all extremely demanding individuals, and you know what it's like to have to get through that. But you also know what the payoff is on the other end. And especially specifically with these these this group of guys who are coming out of COVID, they don't necessarily know that. They they missed a lot. They missed a lot of that interaction that you get from getting coached by real solid men. And there's some really good basketball men in in uh, St. Paul, the Ronnie Smiths, and, and who've coached some teams. Carlos Stewart, who've coached some teams that really poured into those young men. And there was that period of time, that two year disconnect, where they just weren't getting that type of uh, nurturing. So to have the, the players who are now some of these guys are dang near 40 mm -hmm. and they're coming back and they're telling their story they're talking to these young men they're telling them i was you and it's bigger than basketball here and, and, and they're hoping and they're encouraging them holding a standard they're holding them they're holding holding them accountable so that means that means the world to me to have those conversations i had those young men come into the it's crazy i'm calling them young men in their 40s with kids i, mean, I, mean, I know they, they always seem like they're yeah, young people like, to hustle yeah but yeah, true. But, but very true. I yeah, mean, you know, fully grown men. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good kid. Yeah, yeah. A grown man. But he, uh, it's always good to have him around. It, it actually does me good. 
because they come and hold me accountable. And mm-hmm. coach, you getting soft. Coach, you're not as rough as you were. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the stuff you said to me was, <laughs> but it got me through. You know, it's always good to have them around and have them a part of what we're doing and they're helping push the narrative and move the, and change the narrative around our school, our program, and all the such. So it means a lot to have them around. With a little about almost 30 days away from the presidential election, have you talked to your kids about the significance of this election and how important it is? Not in our cases, most of our kids are not ready; they not registered to vote because of their age, but they should at least hearing and seeing okay. what's going on. Uh, have you had a chance to talk to them about you know what this election can do one way or the other, depending on yeah. sure who wins? It's yeah, going to have man. a it's going to have an impact. Absolutely. That could be lasting. Our uh, principal, Jamil Payton, has uh, tasked me with having a young men's group. Uh, it's called the, the Young Men of Distinction. Mm-hmm. Uh, I kind of kind of hijacked it from my fraternity, as we call it, the <laughs> Men of Distinction. But uh, uh, with the, uh, we have our Young Men of Distinction group at uh, at Johnson, and we kind of we talk about everything. We talk about the we've talked about the significance of this election and, and how it can affect them down the road. Um, from Supreme Court nominations and appointments to uh, reproductive rights for their sisters, their aunts, their cousins, their friends, their wives, um, we 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 tackle a lot of head-on issues, and I need them to know exactly. I want them to be able to see a, have a global scope, nationwide scope, and see things bigger than just what's happening in the five five one zero six. So we yeah we we t- we discuss a little bit of everything. All right. Our conversations are a little intense. That's good. Yeah, they are. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a like you said, you a nerd. I'm a nerd in terms of news. I'm, I'm in. I'm listening to all kind of things that's going on because I always want to stay current. That's I think that's one of the reasons why I went into journalism because I always want to keep current with the news. And I always talking to young people when I run into them and talking about the importance of my folk was born in the south couldn't vote in the South. They moved to Detroit because that was the only place they could vote. Uh, so they made it important. They, they made it important to me how important voting was. And I tried to share that with my children. You know, I don't care if the tornado's coming down the street. You go and vote. Right. Because if you don't vote for me, your grandparents couldn't vote. They had to leave their home area, you know, to go vote. We've had people give their lives. Yeah, their lives for yeah. Right. You know, and then I, you know, I was telling him, you know, I had an uncle who got strung up mm-hmm. because he tried to vote, and so they came and got him one night and decided that you know you ain't gonna do this anymore. So I was trying, you know, I was trying to explain them, not to scare them, but say this is this. That's why it's so important. It's not something to just play it off or, or, or oh, I don't feel like going. Or, I don't like the person. So I told him, I said, there's been people I voted for that didn't win, <laughs> right? Okay? But that didn't stop me from voting, right? And I'm still proud that my first vote I ever cast when I became 18 was for the first black man in Detroit. Okay. That was my first that was my first time I got you to vote. And trust me, I've been voting ever since. You know, it's just it's just an important, you know, a, a, a important thing. But people die. If it wasn't, yeah, I was telling this one young man I was talking about, I said, if it wasn't that important, why are they changing laws? Why are they doing Break all this stuff? Sure. You know, it's not that important now. I don't care about ants. I'm not staying in my house. <laughs> but so if it's not that important, why? And he looked at me when I, I said, if it's not that important, why? People are changing laws. They're not letting people vote. They're not letting people do this. not letting people down. You know, if it's not that important, I wouldn't, you know. He looked at me saying, you got people, there are people staying up all night trying to figure out how to keep you from voting. True. Okay. True. And don't understand how important this is. I don't care who you vote for. Mm-hmm. But he was talking about who he wanted to vote for. I said, man, I said, you, I said, I'm going to give you a couple of sites to read. After you read that, you come back and talk to me. Interesting. You know, because I want you to understand how important your choice should be. You know, I don't care who you vote for, but you need, you need to be a clear understanding. So I gave him three. I said, think of your three things that you feel very important for, that you feel is important for you to, to vote for. And keep understanding what who can make those changes for you. It's not always the president of the United States. 
there's other people in that down ballot that you need to look at as well. I was going to say, if you look for a perfect person, that ain't nothing that happening. True. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. You need to find somebody that could fit that <laughs> could, that, could, that, could, that could fit somewhat of what you're looking for. I yeah. said, but you look for a perfect person, ain't none. None of what's perfect. No. no. <laughs> so, not at all. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, this is this has been a crime. I mean, I'm I, I mean that night, legend night. I remember 2020, man. I was, I was up. You know, well, we couldn't go nowhere. I was, <laughs> I was up all night watching. You know, those returns, man. Just that, uh, man. It's, can it, it matter to you? Yeah, it did matter. Well, you, you you've uh you've opened up a door, Mr. Holman. I just want to let you know, I uh, I bring speakers in to speak to my young men at Distinction, so be prepared for a phone call. <laughs> A uh, email asking you to come in and speak because I've already wrote you into the, to the, to the okay. bigger one that we had. Got, yeah, you did. That, you know, oh, yeah, right before district. Cry, I remember. Yeah, yeah. 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 You, you did a great job. So let, let me, let me ask you, you back in. Let me ask you this. Sure. When, as you look back yep. on your on your coaching um, career, it could be games, it could be a practice, it could be, what are some memorable moments? It could be could be a game you won or a game you lost. It could be an interaction you had with a player that ended up working. I don't know. You know, could okay. what are some what are what are what are a couple of uh, good memories or not? Well, yeah, positive memories that you had or things that you never forget. They all matter too much to me. Um, I, I'll start with the, the the winning state in 2010. Okay. Um, just the completion of that season mm -hmm. was uh it was it was it, it was it was something special to me mm -hmm. um it was special to me because the year before this is probably even more special we had another good team before the year before oh. they just couldn't get over the washburn hump yeah um and i went yep. did washburn win it that year washburn, washburn did win it that year they won it yeah, that year yep. uh they had a really good group that year too and i was it, it actually made me proud to see two city teams Mm -hmm. Being bandied about and talked about, one from St. Paul, one from Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. yeah. Everybody wants to see these two inner city groups, mm -hmm. you know, match up, and that just that was phenomenal. But we went down to uh to uh Milwaukee, and when those guys were, I want to say junior, those guys were juniors that actually played and had a wonderful heated discussion with some of the other coaches and and some of our followers, and I I made the statement that well, you know, as good as you guys are, I think these guys are going to be better. And they're going to actually win the whole thing, and nobody. Oh, they can't win it. They can't do it. I'm like, you don't know what they, <laughs> you don't know what they what they're made of. Mm -hmm. They're not a superstar group, but they're a very hungry group that plays together. Mm -hmm. And so to to actually go through that with them, um, from having those guys when they were young, when we took them out to play AAU games, and mm -hmm. um, would do study halls with them, I would take them and feed them, and those guys were kind of like my little my little nephews. So. To watch them, you know, how that come to fruition that that entire season is just one big memory for me. Okay. Um, another one was when we went to I can't remember the year, maybe 2015, 14, something like that. And Jalen Mobley you know, was leading our team that year and went to Minneapolis North in a Twin City game, and it's that game of the best St. Paul versus the best Minneapolis oh, game. That was me, that's 2015. That's 15. Yeah. Okay. They all just run together for me at this point. Mm -hmm. To, to go in there and I, I got some buddies that some some really good friends over north and you know we we, we talk a lot of trash so mm -hmm. um, i told them we're bringing we bringing the baddest dude in the cities to your gym y'all better be prepared and they were doing their talking i'm like i'm telling you he's the baddest dude and he uh 52 points later <laughs> and a hundred and something a hundred and something game uh, yeah did he go to overtime? It went to overtime, if I'm not yeah, mistaken. Yeah, because, because yeah. he had a he had a shot to send it to overtime. Yeah, and because their and their play and their player Jamil Jackson had fifty. I forgot forty something. Forty forty. Yeah, yeah. So oh, that kid was phenomenal. Tyler so, Johnson was on that team. Yeah. Phenomenal. Isaac Johnson. It was some really good players on those teams. So. Yeah, and it was at North. And it was at North. So <laughs> for us to do it at North, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. with the let with two legendary coaches and Vernon Simmons and the legendary, uh, you know, Coach McKenzie. Yeah. I mean, this was with both communities out in force and, you know, okay. cheering on each other and, and rooting for each other in a positive, productive fashion. But most people think we can't gather like that mm -hmm. in those situations. That that was that was memorable to me. Uh, and then just watching my daughter, my oldest, my oldest daughter played 
basketball to me. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's not a coaching memory, but it's, it's, yeah, it's a basketball it's... memory. Right. She went to the state tournament in 2018, and I might have been a little bit more emotional about her making it to the state tournament oh, than any of the years we went. I'm so. pretty sure. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. <laughs> so, yeah, this is just, you know, she, now she's coaching. So, uh, yeah. where is she coaching? She's coaching at the University of Charleston. Mm. Oh, she oh she stayed and she stayed. She's finishing her masters, and um, you know she's 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 coach more now. Mm-hmm. And she her thing is to 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 try to get as many young girls of color from mm-hmm. the inner city, the twin cities, to get them opportunities wherever she might be and whatever connection she might make. She wants to try to help out, and it's like oh, okay. And I you know talking to her I'm like what made you choose this? It's what you did, Dad. I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> I feel pretty good about that. Dad. <laughs> Yeah, those are just a few of the memories specifically around basketball and coaching. Yeah. Now, you mentioned your fraternity. What fraternity do you belong I'm to? I'm a member of Alpha Phi Fraternity Incorporated. Uh, just wanted to make sure we oh, got I that. I to say that slower. They'll be angry. Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. <laughs> Sometimes I speak a little bit too quick. Uh, yeah. uh, roll together. Then they, oh, boy. Yeah. Then, they, then, they, then they get you get the text yeah, messages. Text it's all in the post. Ain't that too fast? <laughs> Make sure it's it's known. Yeah. Now you said. Now you said um, before that was um, those were the, those were the guys when you joined that fraternity that kind of helped you. Those are two of my. Two, two of your, my line, yeah. Right. To your um, uh, helped you on your path. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Dang. Absolutely. Dang. Uh, you, 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 like you said, you went to one HBCU. You left there. You went to a, a Lutheran college. Yep. And then you went to a. Like, yep. What 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 attracts you from the Lutheran College to the second HBCU? Well, okay. One of one of the fraternity brothers I mentioned, Rick Johnson, he uh he decided he was gonna transfer to Prairie View. Okay. A and M. And he you know, during our conversations, driving back and forth from Kenosha to Chicago, hey, we were both like, Hey man, this is dead. I mean, we, we I really appreciate the chapter. I appreciate all the people here, but this isn't us. I went to see, he went to, to sit, Neil F. Simeon. I went to with the young. We were in front of these type of environments to be in a small Lutheran school, though we met some wonderful people where we wanted to see something different, something a little bit more familiar than what we went to high school with. So he chose to go to Prairie View. I chose to go to Southern University and give ourselves a, a different experience than what we were getting. At uh, Carthage College, though we appreciated everything Carthage did for us, but I just couldn't socially. I wasn't fit. <laughs> it wasn't working for me socially. Where is Southern? Oh my goodness! Yeah, Chicago's a different sort of city. You've you got mm-hmm. you've, you're, you're familiar with the uh, yeah. the the hard lines oh, yeah. that are drawn mm-hmm. in in the uh, city. So, as far as my eye could see for a long time, I saw nothing but uh, when I'm in Chicago, it's nothing but us. Mm-hmm. I can see so I get to Carthage and it's like, oh, it's it's us against everybody. We get we really got to band together because we're the minority now. So uh, I wanted to be back into a place where it was a little bit more like home for me. So did you get a chance to go back to Chicago and or, and, or back to Harlem to visit? And my it's my entire almost my entire New York family is dead except for two cousins. Um, so I, I last time I went there was when my mother passed. I want to say that was four years ago. I haven't been back since, but I plan on going back this next upcoming summer because I want to show my uh, show my son, two daughters, where their father spent a lot of you know a lot of his life. So um, take them to the to Harlem, take them to Queens, to even take them over to Jersey because that's where my mother finished her journey in mm-hmm. East Orange, New Jersey. Um, so I, I would like to show them that. But I get back to Chicago probably twice a year. Mm-hmm. It used to be much more frequent. I used to actually just get off work and drive to Chicago for a day, mm-hmm. just because I just I work here, but I live here. <laughs> so um, once I began to, once I had my my wife, my three kids, it was I'm here, and I probably get home once or twice a year. And then when I'm there, I'm in a hurry to get back here because <laughs> this is what my real life is. So, Man. <laughs> but I take my kids back all the time. They're really familiar. My actually, my middle daughter mm-hmm. wants to start her professional life. In Chicago, mm-hmm. when she's done with college. So. Oh wow! Yeah. Well, what school she's at? She's at West Virginia State, which is a which is a uh, HBCU mm-hmm. in West Virginia. So she's there. She's a sorority girl. She's a AKA following her her father's footsteps. <laughs> um, well, you know, 
the equivalent <laughs> on her day. No, yeah. So she's uh playing playing college division two softball. So oh, okay. oldest daughter played division one, division two basketball, middle daughter's playing division two softball. And so she's they're, they're both they're both doing pretty good. So Yeah, they seem to be. They seem to be so you say that am I? You say that you <laughs> your coaching yeah. days are winding down. Absolutely. Um uh, so when they do wind down, what what would be the couple sentences that you want to have tagged on to you when they talk about you? Okay. Um couple sentences. Uh if you could I mean Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, two or three more if you had to. I would I would like to, I would like people to when they when they speak about me to to speak about how family oriented I was. But not just for the ones that share the same blood as me. Mm. Um, that it was bigger than that. It was it was community. It was it was everybody I came in contact with uh, that I showed love to, that showed love to me, that I was a part of that. I opened up my my heart to them and tried to make them a part of my family. So some something familiar mm -hmm. um, would would be what I would like to be said about me. And then the the, the other one is that I read was the expectation because I believe no one rises to a low expectation. So I helped them raise their expectations for what they were capable of. And I would like them to, you know, when I'm gone, just say that I helped you raise your expectations for your life. And now your kid has college on his mind. Now your kid has something more than what you saw that you want to be a better father because you saw me be a father. And I let you be around our family while I was father. I just want them to be the men that they're capable of being and hope that they say I helped a small bit in that. So. Now, do you see yourself once you leave coaching, still being part of the scene, part of the, part of the, you know, like still going to games? I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm not saying hovering over you, uh, your old team, and then you know, do you, you know, do you see yourself still? How can I put this? Still, loving basketball. Absolutely. I fell in love with basketball in the '80s, watching the Celtics and and the Sixers, and and I was an East Coast guy, so I didn't watch too much of the Lakers. I was in bed by the time they came. <laughs> Actually, the games were on tape delay back then. So oh yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> that's how old I am. So uh, oh yeah, the championship games, the championship tape. games on tape delay. So I uh, yeah, I'll always love the game. I'll always watch. I'll always follow the stats. I, as I think I, I, I me and you crack jokes about this before mm -hmm. I knew you and, and, and knew your uh, legendary father, mm -hmm. a highly respected father. I uh, I used to watch his SPNN show. Was it every Tuesday? Oh, yeah. Oh, every yeah. Tuesday. Said, oh, man. I would literally, I got to be home. <laughs> he's coming on at 11. You know what I'm saying? I didn't get home. He, I don't know who we going to have on the show tonight, but it's going to be intense Wonderful, you know, enlightening, true. educational conversation. It's going to go everywhere. It's going to be the best hour of my day right here. Wow. You know what I'm saying? So wow. I will always be a part of the game because mm -hmm. I, I want to know. I want to see everything. I love watching these young people uh, go, you know, try to try to do something with themselves in mm -hmm. sports. I love just to watch them play with passion. I'll, I'll always be around, but I have grown bitter in my old age. You know, <laughs> basketball, I... Uh, you know that. No, I, I uh, I'm a, I'm a real big proponent on the inner city. I'm a real mm. big advocate for the inner city, and I, uh, I'll always be at the inner city games, and I'll always be speaking to parents and people about making sure your kids return mm -hmm. to where you had an opportunity to become who you became. Okay. Instead of us running and doing other things. Uh, you, how, how much have you seen this? the city change in terms of sports mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not you know I'm not talking about St. Paul yeah. I'm talking about just urban, urban. Mm -hmm. how much has it changed from when you got involved to where it at today and we ain't talking about COVID but just seem like mm -hmm. the emphasis that we used to see in the city we don't see as much anymore uh, because uh, parents don't want the kids in the city anymore. They move them out to wherever they move them out to, which is fine. 
everybody's but, choice. But again, the city is the city. It, yes, you know, there's absolutely. There's something about the city. That's the reason why I live in the city. But, <laughs> but it's something about the city that just, you can get out and walk to the store. You can go do these, do these type of things. And I don't, don't see that. And I, I don't know why children who was raised in our mm -hmm. city don't see, have, still have that passion. So you talk, you know, just share your thoughts on that. Oh shoot, I got a, I got a book written about this. Mr. <laughs> Hall, I got a book written about this. Um, my thoughts on it are mm, the, the, the 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 structure from youth basketball is no longer there. Um, a lot of the strong men in the community who played in those communities, who live in those communities, um, who have kids and they're coaching their kids and then volunteering their time to coach other kids, um, not necessarily always their own, they are no longer coaching the game. So their initial invitation or introduction to the game of basketball isn't, isn't the inner city game. Mm -hmm. It's uh, everything's become try to get on this travel team and some of the more organized travel teams, um, if you really want to play high level basketball are unfortunately in our first ring suburbs or further out, um, we're not putting together enough. We don't have, we're not putting the product together. We're not putting the plan together to encourage our young men and then feed into them and pour into them socially as well as uh, athletically so that they can hone their skills. And then the other piece is, we have a lot of jaded alums at our high schools mm -hmm. who have these uh, grandiose notions that they should have been the next Nia Drexler mm -hmm. or Michael Jordan. And it's like, you couldn't even use your left hand. I saw you play. <laughs> you, were just, you were a good kid. You averaged six points. And that was, that was, that was a minor miracle that he was able to pull that out of you. Um, but they always have this mentality. That if I had gone out here mm -hmm. and played for uh, some other coach, then I could have been really great. Mm. And in all reality, you were a D student. Um, you were not dedicated. You didn't come to practice. You didn't do everything that you needed to do. Mm -hmm. And so the the result was you got what you got out of the game because you didn't put enough into the game. So um, we got a lot of those people who are now the youth coaches, a lot of those people who are now the, uh, the parents of some of our kids, mm -hmm. and they want to redo mm. or give a different opportunity to their child and what ha what they felt happened to them or they experienced and the the quickest fix is to just hey I'll go over here mm -hmm. and, and 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 try my hand over there and uh, I can't speak for most uh, communities I can only speak for my community which is the east side of St Paul we have a uh, a prevalent mentality of another it's always better with somebody else. Mm. I'll, I'll, I'll just say it that way. It might be the nicest way to say it. <laughs> that they they can provide me the opportunity. They can open the door for me instead of us doing for us and helping us and staying true to your community. We always look to go and sit at the table of another person, even if we weren't invited to sit at table, because we 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 prefer to 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 think that that's going to uh, be what's best for us. And, and it it's kind of robbed the inner city of a lot of our best and brightest athletes. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at some of the addresses or you know some of the families of some of the best players and you're like, didn't you go to Washburn? So why don't your kids go to Minnetonka? Mm -hmm. like, didn't you play at this school? Why your kids go to North St. Paul and, and Tartan? Mm -hmm. Well, the coach, they, uh, they, they don't do a good job. But if you're the parent, you have the right to voice your opinion and help change and steer mm -hmm. from an adult's perspective you know, in a parenting perspective, you can steer the programs if you take advantage of your opportunities instead of just saying, you know what, forget it, I'll run from it. It wasn't good enough for me. It didn't I didn't get what I, I wanted out of it, so I'll do something else. But my, my last problem with that point to that is, Mr. Allman, is we loudly and gladly run away from our communities mm -hmm. and we brag and, and, and have our nose up mm -hmm. when we run out to the other communities, but then when it doesn't pan out the way it was promised to us. We silently Come stomp back, back into back. the inner city. Mm -hmm. And then we get the, uh, well, you got to do it now. Fix it. <laughs> Fix it. He spent three years. This is not our style. What am I? 
<laughs> and why do we always have to fix someone else's problem? You should have trusted us in the beginning. But I digress from that point, Mr. Mm -hmm. it, it's a. Uh, it, it, it's troubling to me. I wish some of our more talented kids would stay in the city. I wish our uh, some of our families would trust the inner city programs, trust who they are now as adults, as opposed to who they were as children and young people, and understand that they can steer and change the narratives around their schools and the, school, and the programs at their schools, and that they, they're needed to make these changes, hmm. to provide those opportunities that they feel they don't get. Yeah. Now, usually uh, at the end of our program, and you might not have anything, but we usually give you a chance to um, talk about anything um, that we probably didn't talk about, something that you might want to share um, that wasn't shared, um, or, you know, um, pearls of wisdom for the, for the um, audience out here. You don't have to. You don't have to have it. I'm not that wise of a guy. I'm mm -hmm. not that sage of an individual to just have pearls and wisdom that I just sit around and I don't drop all the time. So um, I really have nothing. You got to do a phenomenal job. So this is, this is like my new podcast pod hold. I'll be going down. <laughs> Rabbit hold. I'll be going down. Uh, since I don't have your father, God bless him, bless him, <laughs> to, to sneak home and watch his uh, his interviews. I, I, you send me that link and I literally have watched three so far. So I've got more to watch. So I don't have anything anything to say. I just would like to, I would just like our young people to, 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 to be, give themselves an opportunity. Okay. I would like our, our families, our communities to, to build themselves, heal themselves and hold our kids to an, to an expectation. We wish that someone held us to, because okay. we have the opportunity. Our kids are, unfortunately, some of them are literally dying for that type of interaction from mm -hmm. us and that type of leadership and relationship from us. And I think it's, it's, it behooves us to make those sacrifices to give them those opportunities. I, and I know for myself personally, I got more days behind me than I do in front of me. So I gotta, I want to live my, uh, I want to, you know, I want to feel every minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run. So, got you know. Okay. Well, Colin, we really appreciate you stopping by and spending time with us. Like, you know, now when I when we play each other, I come shake your hand. Huh? <laughs> hey, come on over. Huh? Yeah, it's yeah. crazy. Most people don't think I'm friendly, yeah, but I'm yeah. actually straight. Well, hey, it's the same with him. He he, he he's not a handshake. That's why that's 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 why they're gonna be they they're, they're gonna be looking like. People that know him are going to be looking at him. He's actually going over to shake his own coaches. He don't even shake his own coaches. His own coaches, the South coaches' hands. He don't even shake them. But so. <laughs> well, we really want to really want to thank you for uh, being here. And uh, we really appreciate, uh, you know, everything um, that you said. We appreciate everything that you are doing, you know, um, to, to help our youth and to... Uh, be an example for um, for everyone you know um, in the in the black community. So it's something uh, that we really appreciate. So I want to thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Being here. Thank you all for being on um, Black Sport. I mean, um, Black Light on Sports. Uh, make sure you read our columns. I'm uh, Dr. Mitchell Palmer McDonald. I'm Charles Holman. Thank you for joining us, and please come back again.